Hello, this is a quick revision video on the inflation and deflation part of the Economics A2 Level Unit 4. I'm sure you're familiar with these from just Economics in general and Econ 2, but inflation is a sustained increase in the general price level and deflation is a fall in the general price level. Inflation is usually measured with the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, so this doesn't include house prices, and if we want to include house prices in terms of inflation, that's the RPI. The CPI is essentially measured using a basket of goods, so it contains goods that lots of different households buy, and we look at the movements in these prices over a 12-month period, typically, in order to get an idea of these prices and what people are buying and waiting and stuff, because waiting means that if people buy lots and lots of tea and not very much, I don't know, sugar, then tea will be given a higher sort of, higher proportion of the waiting as such. So it will, if changes in tea will show up as more significant than changes in the price of sugar. Uh, anyway, so they get the, the ideas from this from the Family Expenditure Survey, which is a representative monthly survey of UK household expenditures. So they ask people, you know, what they're buying, how much it's costing and that sort of thing. The price weight index for each good is calculated by doing the price index multiplied by its weighting. For a price index, goods will start with a value of 100 and then each year this value will change depending on changes in the price of the good and then the weighting as we said before. In terms of calculating a percentage change you do the change in price divided by the original price. If you want more detail on calculations including the CPI there's an AS video on inflation that I've got which has got I think it's got a calculation worked through so if you want to look at that. There are two big types of inflation there's cost push inflation and demand pull inflation. Cost push inflation is when there's an economy-wide increase in the cost of production. So this can happen for a lot of reasons. For example, if, if economies abroad are experiencing inflation or they might just be experiencing shortage of fuel, I don't know, but for some reason, the stuff that they're Im exporting to us is rising in prices. And if we're importing raw materials from abroad and they're getting more expensive, then we're going to have to make our goods more expensive as well to cover this extra cost of production. So that could be one reason for inflation. Essentially anything that causes a factor of production to rise in cost will cause there to be cost push inflation. So another one we've got there is rising labour costs. If we have a rise in the minimum wage, if we've got trade unions fighting for higher wages, that can lead to inflation. Higher indirect taxes. So this is a cost to the firm. If the government puts tax on cigarettes, say, I mean cigarettes are relatively inelastic, so the consumer will take the bulk of that tax. And if the consumer is paying more, then the price must be higher. And if the price is higher, inflation! Dun, 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 dun. Now, if we put all of these factors together, we can see that the costs of production are rising and so prices are rising. This means that all the workers are going to be thinking, oh my god, I can't afford anything. So they are going to be pushing their bosses to give them higher wages. So if they're pushing their boss for higher wages, boss has to give them a higher wage, then their cost of production has gone up even more, so they're going to have to put up their prices. It essentially leads to a wage price spiral. Because if wages are rising, then cost of production is rising, cost of production is rising, prices have to rise to ma match that, and so on and so forth. Love writing about that, so that's definitely a good one to mention in the exam. Our other main type of inflation is demand pull inflation, which happens when there's a rise in aggregate demand leading to increased prices. So on the diagram there, we can see that if there's little spare capacity in the economy, so say we're on AD2, any increase in aggregate demand will lead to a rise in price level with very little rise in output. That's inflation. This is the quantity theory of money, which essentially states that an increase in the money supply in an economy will lead to inflation. And it's supported by the Fisher equation, which you can see there, which is M times V. Has the, so it's sort of an identity, that equals sign when it's got three equals. It will always equal P times T, where M is the monetary supply and V is the velocity of circulation. So money supply times velocity of circulation will always equal the general price level times transactions, which is the same as output, which is the same as real GDP. So the equation essentially says if we increase the money supply, unless we decrease the velocity of circulation or increase transactions output real GDP, we're going to see a rise in the price level. Since we want some level of inflation, target of approximately 2%, a lot of economists argued that we should have very careful constant increase in the money supply, that's very carefully sort of organised and done carefully.
I said carefully quite a lot of times then. I think one of the people behind this idea was Milton Friedman, who was a monetarist. Monetarists essentially advocated for the control of money supply within the economy. There is a massive difference between healthy inflation, 2%, which allows room for improvements in quality and general flexibility and stuff like that, and hyperinflation, which is a very large rapid increase in general price level. I think this happened in Zimbabwe, happened in the Weimar Republic of Germany just before Hitler got in. A lot of people think that this hyperinflation actually gave Hitler the ability to draw crowds to his sort of very strong extreme political views. So actually, hyperinflation could have led to Hitler and all that bad stuff. Sorry, it's a bit insensitive to eat porridge whilst I'm trying to talk about that. Prices are rising so fast that savings become worthless. So you might have got 10,000 quid saved up in the bank, but now a loaf of bread is 10,000 quid. It tends to happen very, very quickly, this massive escalation. Like, you get a few warning signs, it gets quite bad, and then suddenly, prices are crazy, uncontrollably crazy. Something I'm quite interested in, actually, the other day I was thinking about this, as you do. I was thinking that people that are exceptionally rich, so the very, very rich people, will tend to have their sort of savings in forms other than money. So paintings and diamonds and things that won't lose its value because you can simply keep hold of it. And then once the economy has all sorted itself out, you'll still have something of high value regardless of the value of money. So perhaps the richest people in a population don't suffer so badly as a result of inflation as everyone else just a random thought number two cost of hyperinflation is that if there's hyperinflation everyone's going crazy running around like headless chickens there is a fall in confidence and no one's going to be investing in this time there will literally be zero investment going on the economy will go haywire businesses will shut down they'll collapse they'll fail the world will grind to a halt except it won't because we're on an axis and we have to keep spinning but it will it'll go crazy and that will lead to an economic slowdown. Bum, ba, 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 ba. Here we have a list of consequences of high inflation. Arranged in a rainbow with a few colours which definitely aren't in the rainbow. Ba, da. So our first one is international competitiveness. If we've got inflation, our prices are going to be higher than the prices abroad. Unless they've got inflation as well. But assuming they don't, our prices will be higher and we'll find it hard to export. This will lead to a balance payments deficit. Money will flood out of the country. And the world will die. Sort of. Second one. Falling investment. We've said this one before. Same as hyperinflation, though not quite as bad. There'll be low confidence if all prices keep going up and up and up. So low investment and therefore unemployment. And if we've got unemployment, then that helps to bring the economy to a slowdown. Unemployment will come to the cost of unemployment in another video. Or we did it at AAS, definitely. But tend to get sort of high crime when there's unemployment. You get hysteresis, that sort of thing. Then we will have unanticipated inflation. So this is a sort of type of inflation almost. If inflation comes as a shock to businesses who weren't expecting it, then it will lead to a massive fall in confidence, bigger than a fall in confidence of just normal inflation. Because inflation's there anyway. If it's a bit higher than usual, businesses might be like, uh-oh. But if there's suddenly some inflation that people weren't predicting, businesses will be a bit shocked about it. They might not have put it into their workings out, so they'll be treading very, very carefully. That's probably not a great point to put down in an essay. I wouldn't advise it. Menu costs is essentially the Ministry of Costs of changing prices, which lead to an even greater rise in price. So, obvious one to do is a menu in a restaurant. If prices keep going up, then the restaurant can't keep charging 10 quid for a steak. They might have to charge 20 quid for a steak. They changed the restaurant menu at my local restaurant the other day. Fun fact. I didn't notice. Um, I don't know why I told you that. Shoe leather costs is the time and money spent shopping around to find the best prices. This is both true for consumers and firms. If prices are sort of quite unstable all over the place, you're not just going to buy the first TV you see. You're going to walk from shop to shop until you see the best TV. I'm pretty sure when we bought a TV like 10 years ago, we went from shop to shop. There were two shops opposite each other and we just pitted them off against each other and told them, oh, look, Curry's is offering us this for blah. I don't know if it worked, but I remember doing that because my feet started to hurt. And shoe leather costs, it's named shoe leather because you're rubbing away the leather on the foot of your shoe. Income redistribution problems. Essentially, borrowers win and lenders savers lose. So if you've borrowed money, that's great because the money you've borrowed has fallen in value. So the value of the money you're paying back is less. 
on the other hand it's the opposite way around for people that have lent money so sucks to be you uh, also talking of income redistribution problems if you have a minimum wage job if you've got a low paid job and there's inflation you're going to find that the purchasing power of the money you're being paid falls so you won't be able to buy as much of your income which isn't great and it can lead to industrial revelations which is the next point here i don't know if i was meant to say revelations or revulsions revolting revelations i don't think it's meant to say revelations i'm going to look that up it's meant to say relations but i think it's quite funny when it says revelations I'm just going to leave that in there, and then in the exam you'll be thinking, ooh, revelations, ooh, relations. <laughs> yeah, so essentially industrial relations, which is basically issues because everyone's like, oh, I'm not getting paid enough, so they push for higher wages, you might get striking and that sort of thing, and it's generally unpleasant atmosphere. Fiscal drag, that is not my image, I found it on the internet because I thought it would be a hilarious thing to have. It's not actually that funny, but I quite like it, and it will definitely remind you of fiscal drag in the exam. For those of you that don't recognize it it's david cameron in drag as margaret thatcher it's been edited together i assume not my picture but whoever it is love you forever mate okay so essentially fiscal drag is the increase in the burden of taxation so tax allowances aren't increased in line with inflation so let's imagine you're a small business that are producing melons say and you have a tax-free allowance of 10,000 quid and after 10,000 pounds you have to start paying tax if the inflation happens money becomes less valuable so 10,000 pounds a year ago might be worth you know 12,000 pounds this year if you're still paying tax at the 10,000 pound margin the value of uh, which you start to pay tax is lower in sort of real value so you end up paying more tax which sucks and essentially, if this is a serious level of inflation, this could lead to the collapse of a small business. It could lead to closures, local unemployment, maybe a local multiplier effect downwards. Du, 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 du. Finally, hyperinflation. We've already talked about it, but it is the evil of all evils. Ta-da! Prices might also fall as well as rise. They might fall because there is increase in the quality of the technology used to produce it. So say I owned a factory that produced mugs, before I could produce 10 mugs a day, then I got this crazy new machine in, and I can now produce 20 mugs a day, and I'm still hiring the same number of workers, maybe even less, because I've got this really cool machine. My costs of production have gone down, so I could pull my prices down, because if I'm not paying as much to produce them, I might want to increase the sort of demand for them, and lower the price, and that leads to deflation essentially but that type of inflation is benign deflation because it's due to technological advances whereas malevolent deflation i love that word malevolent i think there's a film called malevolent maleficent maleficent never saw it but apparently it was really good i'm pretty sure it wasn't called malevolent (laughs) and that's when you've got falling prices due to an economic downturn so say we've got a fall in aggregate demand money supply falls Falling confidence, falling prices, unemployment. This is actually getting quite embarrassing, the singing, because I can't sing. It's not even singing, it's dramatic sound effects. For those of you that watched the video before this one on economic growth, where I slammed half asleep, (laughs) this is the same day I'm recording this on. I'm just a bit more awake. I think it was the porridge. (laughs) But essentially, malevolent deflation is a fall in prices due to insufficient demand. So we've got the same number of goods, for example, but demand's fallen. So the only way to still sell your goods is going to be to decrease the price of them. Hooray! We have reached the end of inflation. Join us next time for unemployment. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's helped and that I haven't been too crazy because I think I have been. Uh, Have a lovely day, have a lovely evening, have a lovely lifetime. See you soon. Bye!